was a 12-week study. We evaluated three doses of 74809 um, with a two-fold increase across the dose range uh, across each of the dose levels. So we have 40, 80, and 160 milligrams given once daily. This was compared to placebo. Uh, we had about 22 to 23 patients for each of these groups. And uh, we allowed um, approved therapies or standard of care therapies for the treatment IP of IPS, but we also stratified so it would be evenly distributed across the group. And uh, we had as a primary and secondary endpoint for the study, safety and tolerability was the primary, and then pharmacokinetics was the secondary. And the exploratory endpoints included uh, evaluation of the endpoint that is uh, registrational for uh, approval of therapy. So that's false vital capacity. Um, and um, we also included biomarker imaging that was based on HRCT or high resolution CT scans. Uh, and this is a technology that is able to measure the degree of change in terms of the, the scarring in the lung um, with, you know, with computer algorithms. So it's a technology that's been around for quite a while and uh, has been used both in the natural history setting, but also uh, in, in uh, recently in interventional studies. So we were excited to include that because it's certainly something that, um, you know, in terms of 74809's mechanism of action being an antifibrotic, uh, we wanted to see whether we could see these changes in fibrosis would be manifested uh, using uh, imaging because FVC as such is, is certainly uh, also correlated with the, the, the progression of the disease, but it's not necessarily purely the, a mechanism, if you wish. Like a, have a, having less fibrosis will, should lead to better, uh, better FVC. However, there's a motivational aspect in doing this method, you know, this measure for patients. And we know that there are certain limitations uh, that, that um, you know, we, it's, it's not necessarily always uh, in line um, Always, you don't always need an antifibrotic mechanism to see a change in FEC because of these aspects, but uh, we wanted to be very thorough in evaluation because we had done a lot of previous work, mechanistic work, to show uh, that our drug is acting on its target, alpha V beta 6. This was in, uh, in IPF patients, in the lungs of IPF patients, and we also had seen in healthy volunteers that it was able to reduce CJ bed activation in the lung in, um, in, you know, with, with short-term dosing. So for us, having an, uh, um, a technology like QLF would give us a different read, uh, but certainly support the mechanism, the mechanism of the compound. And so what we did is we treated these patients for, for 12 weeks. And just in terms of the summary of the results, we saw very favorable safety with no discontinuations due to adverse events. We had uh, no drug-related serious adverse events. Um, we had enrolled a patient population that approximately 80% of them were on standard of care regimens. So that's also very nice to see that um, in addition to existing therapies, our drug did not add to the toxicity liabilities for the existing agents because you had no discontinuations on because of uh, 2GAE. But importantly, in terms of the exploratory efficacy markers, we saw uh, dose-dependent improvements and forced vital capacity over 12 weeks. Uh, this was a um, really beautiful finding um, because we weren't, we weren't sure if we would see these changes manifest as early as 12 weeks, but in our study, we've seen them and the strong efficacy signal was present uh, based on, on what you know, we consider or what is considered the registrational endpoint. Um, but we also saw the consistency in terms of the QLF score, which I talked about, the biomarker imaging, uh, where we also saw these dose-dependent changes. And that, that really supports the mechanism of action of the drug. In addition to that, we also had serum biomarkers of, of, fibro of fibrosis, and we saw dose-dependent changes in, in these biomarkers as well, further supporting the antifibrotic properties of our compounds. So we're really, really excited uh, that we could learn so much uh, in um, you know, what is a 90-patient study that has a 12-week duration. There was only one adverse event that, that occurred uh, with an incidence of 10% uh, or greater, uh, and that was... Uh, mild to moderate diarrhea, uh, basically. And, and that was, we looked back at who experienced these diarrhea, and I think the, uh, the incidence roughly um, 
17 or 18 percent of diarrhea in the, the um, combined 74809 groups. When we looked at uh, those uh, cases of diarrhea that were drug related, that went down to 12 percent. And then when we looked at um, who were these patients that had this mild to moderate diarrhea, these were patients taking uh, the 12 out of the 13 were taking nintenative. So if you're familiar with nintenative, that's really the key uh, adverse drug reaction is diarrhea. In fact, in the registrational studies that are described in the uh, OFEV label, uh, you have 62% rate. So it's pretty high. And um, certainly uh, the fact that we had 18% in terms of our compound, our uh, data, uh, suggest that it's it's really uh, well below what you typically expect to see with uh, with a standard of care agent. Um, importantly, no patients discontinue due to diarrhea, uh, and also in our phase one evaluation, diarrhea was reported very infrequently uh, in these studies. So uh, we also saw that this diarrhea was only in the presence of standard of care, was not with with 809 or 74809 alone. So it's for us, it seems that. This could certainly be uh, associated with the background therapy that these uh, patients were, were receiving. You know, we have everything we need from the data from this study to engage with the regulators in terms of um, getting a sense of whether they, um, getting some, some guidance or, or feedback on our proposed late stage development approach. Uh, and we're planning to have a meeting with the FDA uh, later this year and the uh, EMA early the next. Um, most likely. Um, and what, what we'll be discussing is uh, something that we're really, um, would, that would really provide a program that would provide robust uh, phase 2B evaluation so we can really be confident in the dose we're selecting for phase 3, but also that allows mm -hmm. for efficiencies and uh, an adaptive trial design is what we're looking at uh, to, to do that because it can really, um, can really accelerate your time to NDA. Uh, however, these adaptive designs, even though the FDA has guidance on, uh, you know, do, running uh, adaptive designs, and they've done it also, the respiratory division has, has uh, done it for uh, drugs and asthma and COPD. They've never done it for IPS. So for us, we want to know what their appetite is for contemplating such a study design in IPS. Um, and uh, we'll be also including the data from, from this study as part of this, um, you know, this interaction. We don't need the results for the 320 milligram cohort to have this interaction because we already have strong, a strong uh, efficacy signal in in, on top of the, the great safety we saw. Uh, but the 320 milligram cohort that's been fully enrolled at the end of June uh, the 12 week results from that cohort will read out uh, in early 2023. So, you know, by the time that we get the regulatory feedback, uh, also we'll have the 12 week data for the 312, 320 milligram dose. So we'll, we'll have a much, much more rich information to determine our next step and, and where, you know, certainly as it relates to the dose selection, the, the, let's say the study design for late stage doesn't depend on the 320 milligram group, but the dose selection for late stage will certainly be informed by this group. So, uh, you know, in early 2023, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll just get a lot of information that is really going to help us decide what's, what's going into phase 2B. Ideally, this, these are two doses, right, that we bring forward and then we select uh, a dose in phase 3. In terms of uh, the, the progression of IPS, that's also something that uh, is a little bit hard to predict. Um, we know that, you know, for example, if you think about liver disease, if you're pre-cirrhotic, you have a great chance of becoming cirrhotic. So, you know, we expect that patients with that are pre-cirrhotic, you know, could become cirrhotic in a trial study. I mean, a trial uh, um, in, a, in a study that evaluates treatment. But for IPS, uh, past prediction doesn't predict uh, future progression or past progression doesn't predict future progression. So that's a little bit the challenge. But what's known is that uh, if you look at a uh, categorical change in FEC of 10% or greater in percent predicted FEC, uh, so that's also one of the data that we presented where we saw the clear dose, the clear dose response was in that uh, more stringent endpoint looking at FEC. 
this is uh, giving you, for example, if you achieve a greater than 10% progression uh, in 12 weeks, you have a twofold increase in mortality or disease progression in the next two years that follow. So this is really important data for us because we see that, you know, it is um, going in line with the dose response we saw for the biomarker imaging as well. So these two sets of data show an, a nice dose response and um, the, the big difference between the 160 milligram group and the placebo group for that 10% uh, increase are really quite striking. Um, and uh, just for the relevance of what, you know, I talked about the clinical relevance of that uh, threshold of 10% um, relative change. It's also, it's also part of the regulatory, it's a regulatory meaningful endpoint because that, that degree of progression makes it into the clinical outcome measures that you, you evaluate in addition to death and respiratory-related hospitalization. So usually for um, clinical outcomes, it's composite and composite endpoints that include that threshold. And, and that is also reflected by, if you look at the ESBRIET and the OFAV labels, they have a very clear description of the proportion of patients who meet that threshold uh, in their studies. So it's something that um, if you go back to, you know, the OFAV or the Bringer, uh, the, um, the ESBRIET um, websites, they use that as part of their promotional material. So when we're thinking about, you know, building, building really a competitive and differentiated compound for the treatment of IPF, we're really putting all our, uh, our efforts to really make sure that we can, you know, at the time that, you know, at the time that uh, uh, 74809 would get approved, if everything goes to plan, uh, we're going to maybe be in a more crowded market, but we want to also have a really clear um, definition of, you know, these, these progression that you can see and also the effect that you can see with or without standard of care uh, in phase 2B. And maybe that's a quick point to make that we really want to increase our proportion uh, of patients not on standard of care to about 30 percent. Uh, in our late stage evaluation, so we have a really good, you know, good, good data there to support the label 